ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته so um it's a pleasure to join my brothers and sisters my muslim family in the philippines specifically those at wisdom islamic school in davao city may allah ta'ala bless you all and give you all success in this life and the next inshallah ta'ala this morning for you guys this evening for us we're going to speak about taqwa of allah during times of calamities and this talk is going to be broken down into three parts the short talk is in three parts the first part will be taqwa of allah the second part will be the harmful effects of sin and the third part will be sinning during a calamity fa aqulu billahi tawfiq the first part is taqwa allah ta'ala has commanded all of his creation to have taqwa of him to have fear of him when he said ya ayyuhan nas taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida o mankind have taqwa of your lord the one who created you from a single soul that is surah an-nisa verse number 1 and he specified the believers with this command he specified it to the to the believers when he said يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون او you who believe fear Allah as he should be feared and do not die except as Muslims this is surah ali imran verse number 102 and Allah ta'ala he said يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله ان الله خبير بما تعملون او you who believe fear allah and let every soul look to see what it has put forward for tomorrow and have taqwa of allah indeed allah is all aware of that which you do surah al-hashr verse number 18 likewise Allah azza wa jal commanded all the previous nations that came before us to have taqwa of him to fear him when he said wa laqad wasayna alladhina utu alkitaba min qablikum wa iyyakum an ittaqu Allah and indeed we have commanded those who were given the book before you and you to have taqwa of Allah this is surah al-nisa verse number 141 and Allah ta'ala he commanded his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to have taqwa when he said ya ayuhan nabiy taqullah o prophet have taqwa of Allah surah al-ahzab verse number 1 so what is the meaning of taqwa The linguistic meaning in the language is to protect to protect yourself from that which you fear. As for the religious meaning it is to perform the commands of Allah desiring his reward while staying away from the prohibitions of Allah fearing his punishment the great sahaba the leader of the believers ali ibn abi talib may allah ta'ala be pleased with him he explained taqwa by saying here al khawf min al jalil it is to have fear from the majestic one wal amalu bi tanzil and to work according to the revelation with the dad bil rahil and to prepare yourself for the journey and whoever does that then he has feared Allah as he should be feared al khawf min al jalil to have 
fear from the majestic one. This is Allah Azza wa Jal, of course, to have fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. Second, al-amlu bi tanzil, to work by the revelation, meaning to work according to al-kitab wa sunnah, the book, the Quran, and the sunnah. Wa istidad al-rahil, and to prepare yourself for the journey. What journey? The journey that every person is going to take from this world until the hereafter. And the way that you prepare yourself for the journey is by doing righteous actions. There is no doubt that everyone is going to make this journey. And like any other journey that you take, you need what? You need provisions, right? And that's why Allah Ta'ala said, what does the way do? in the khayr zad at taqwa and so prepare your provisions and indeed the best provision is taqwa the best provision that you can take on that inevitable journey from this life to the hereafter is to have taqwa okay that's part one part two the harmful effects of sins if we don't fear Allah and we disobey him without making tawbah, without repentance, then our sins have a harmful effect. Of course, nobody is ma'asum. No one is free from error. We are all going to fall short and commit sins. But when we sin, we have to rush to make tawbah, to repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. And if we do not, then we have to know that our sins have a harmful effect. The great Imam Ibn Qayyim, alayhi rahmatullah, he said it is necessary to know that sins and transgressions are harmful. And this is based upon what Allah Ta'ala said, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ And whatever befalls you from calamity, it is based upon what your own hands have put forward and he pardons much. Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him, he said, no calamity comes down except because of sin and it is never removed except due to toba. right? Every calamity that befalls the people and this is something that we need to think about when we're experiencing things like the coronavirus, hurricanes, tsunamis, etc. Even personal hardships. No sin befalls the people except be no calamity. No calamity befalls the people except because of sin and is not removed except because of toba. So now we're going to mention some examples because there are many harmful effects of sins. We're going to mention some specific examples of how sins harm us and there are many we're just going to mention some of them inshallah ta'ala one harmful result of sin is it prevents us from knowledge imam al-shafi'i alayhi rahmatullah when he sat down with imam malik and he began to converse with him recite for him what he knew of knowledge Imam Malik was impressed with him and he was impressed with his vast knowledge and deep understanding. So he said to him, Indeed, I see that Allah has placed upon your heart light. Indeed, I see that Allah has put light in your heart. So do not extinguish that light. Don't put that light out with the darkness of sin. So sin can prevent us from gaining knowledge. Another harmful effect of sin is the loss of money and provision. Ahmed narrated from Thoban, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him. He said, إِنَّ الْعَابْ لَيُحْرَمْ الْرِسْقْ بِذَمْ يُصِيبُ He said, indeed, an individual, the slave, the individual will be prevented from provisions based upon a sin that he committed. 
So just as having taqwa of Allah Ta'ala is a reason to gain provision, leaving off not fearing Allah Ta'ala. If you don't fear him, it is a reason to fall into poverty. So just like taqwa brings provision, not fearing Allah Ta'ala causes poverty. Another harmful effect of sin is it can make you alienated and distant from the people. Al-Wahsha, it can make you distant from the people. So a person may commit a sin and now he wants to be distant from the people of good. So you may find a person and now he doesn't want to come to the masjid anymore. He's avoiding the believers. So the more he falls into sin, the more he separates himself from the believers. And consequently, he doesn't benefit from their good. So now he's not coming to the masjid. So he's missing the classes. He's missing the prayer. Right? And the more he goes away from the allies of Allah, he goes closer to the allies of Ash-Shaytan. Right? Not only that, a person will commit a sin and now he feels alienated. He feels distant from his own wife and from his children and from his relatives. Rather, a person can even feel alienated from their own self. And so look at how the Salaf had a deep understanding. Those pious men and women who came before us from the Sahaba and those after them, they understood that the relationship that they had with the people was a direct reflection upon the relationship that they had with Allah Azawajal. Right? Ibn Taymiyyah, alayhi rahmatullah, he said, if you see a person criticizing the people when they harm him, but he doesn't look back at himself and criticize himself, and ask Allah for forgiveness. He said then know that this is the real great calamity. Again, he said if you see the individual and he criticizes the people when they harm him, but he doesn't take the matter back and criticize himself and then seek Allah's forgiveness, then know that this is the real calamity. So when people harm us, when people cause us harm, are we putting all the blame on the people or do we realize that Allah allowed these people to harm us based upon a sin that we did? It was said to Abi Sulaiman at darani alayhi rahmatullah, why is it that the intelligent people don't criticize those people who are mean and evil to them? He said it's because they know that Allah has only tried them based upon their sins. Meaning these people are only harming us because of sins that we did. And for this reason, the great scholar al fadil ibn Iyal ibn al-Rahmatullah he said, indeed, I will disobey Allah. And I can see that disobedience in the character of my donkey, my servant, my wife, even the mouse in my house. Allah Akbar. He said, I will disobey Allah and I can see the effects of that disobedience in the character of my donkey, my servant, my wife, and even the mouse in my house acts different because I disobeyed Allah Ta'ala. Even the pain we feel, we, we feel pain in our body sometimes. We have to trace it back to the sin. al Hassan al-Basri, he said, He said, we entered upon Imran ibn Hussein. And a man said, it is imperative, it is a must that we ask you about this pain we see you in. You're in pain. Where is this pain from? And he said, Ya akhi, la, 
He said, oh, my brother, don't do that. Don't ask me about this. He said, because I swear by Allah, I love this pain. And the people who are able to love pain like this will be beloved to Allah. He said, because Allah Ta'ala said, no calamity befalls you except by what your hands have put forward and he pardons much. He says, so this pain that I feel, it is because of a sin that my own hands have done and my Lord has pardoned most of what I did. The Salaf had a great understanding, Ya Akhwan. They didn't blame the people. Today, we blame the people for everything, not realizing that it all goes back to us. And keep in mind that we sin and you may not see the effects of that sin until much later. So we always have to make repentance for the sins that we are aware of and those that we have forgotten about. The great scholar Ibn Sarin, he incurred a debt and the debt made him sad. And he said, indeed, I know that this sadness is from a sin I did 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Now, one of the worst harms of sin, as mentioned by Ibn Ajozi, is he said that, al-ma'asiyah ba'd al-ma'asiyah. He said that a sin after a sin is the punishment for the initial sin. Just like a good deed after a good deed is the reward for the initial good deed. The sin that you do after the first sin is a punishment for the first sin we did. Just like the good deed that we do after the good deed is the reward for the initial good deed that we did. And the last thing about this part two is a tremendous statement by the great Sahaba Ibn Abbas. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him and his family. He mentioned that which is worse than the sin. He said, oh, sinner, don't feel safe from an evil ending. And that which comes after the sin is worse than the sin. He said, and now he's going to mention some things that are actually worse than the sin that we do. Pay attention to what he says. He says, your little shyness from the angel on your right side and left side while you are sinning is worse than the sin. Right, because we know, and this is a footnote explaining what what um, the, um, Ibn Abbas said. We know that we have everyone has an angel on their right side and on their left side, and they're watching us all the time. The angel on the right is writing down our good deeds. The angel on the left is writing down our bad deeds. Now look at what Allah Taala said. He said, "Inna alaykum lahafidin, kiramen katibin." He says, and verily over you are preservers, meaning those who are guarding your deeds. Kiramen, they are noble. Kati being, they are scribes writing down. The great scholar Sheikh Uthaymin, as he explains that Allah Ta'ala told us that they are noble for a reason, right? He said, indeed, there are over you guardians. They are noble. They are scribes. He said Allah Ta'ala told us that they are noble for a reason because we are commanded to honor them. The angels on your right and left side that are always with you, whether you go in the bathroom, regardless of whether you're at, they're always writing down your good deeds and bad deeds. Allah Ta'ala told us they are kiram and they are noble for a reason so we can honor them by what? By doing good deeds and not having them watch us commit sin. You know, there's a reason that we don't go to the masjid after eating garlic. Why is that? Because the smell of garlic is offensive to the believers and offensive to the angels. Likewise, 
sins are offensive to the angels. Imagine, may Allah protect us from this, if, if you think about the nobles, the elders in your community, right? Can you imagine committing a sin in front of the elders, the, the respected people of your community? How offensive that would be to them to have to watch you commit sin. How about the angels? Whenever we sin, we're forcing the angels to look at us in this evil state. You want to have the angel watch you commit a sin. That's disrespectful. That's why Allah Ta'ala told us that we have to honor them. Now, so back to the statement of Ibn Abbas. He said, you're laughing. He said, you're laughing while you don't know what Allah is going to do to you it is greater than your sin. He said, you're being happy with the sin. If you are able to commit the sin, it is worse than your sin. And you're being sad if you miss out on the sin, it is worse than your sin. And then he said, and you being afraid when the wind moves the curtain on your door is worse than your sin. Meaning what? If a person is in their room and they're hiding from everyone except from Allah and the angels, but they're hiding from the people. And then the wind hits the door and you think that someone has caught you sinning. Then you become afraid. But you were not afraid when you thought the only one watching you was your Lord. That didn't matter that much. That didn't stop you from sinning. When the only one watching you was your Lord, that didn't matter. When it was the angels on your right and left, that didn't matter. But when you thought that a man saw you, then you became afraid. That's worse than the sin that you did. And lastly, he said, you having no regard for the fact that Allah is watching you is worse than the sin. The fact that you don't have any regard that Allah is watching you sin is worse than the sin. Part three, and this is the final part, sins doing a calamity. al naim ibn Bashir al-Ansari, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him, he said, in al-halak kull halak and ta'amal al-sayyat fi zaman al-bala. He said, indeed, destruction, complete destruction, is that you commit disobedience during the time of a calamity. Indeed, destruction, complete destruction, is that you do acts of disobedience during the time of a calamity. And why is that? Because during a calamity, it is the time that people reflect about their sins, right? Just like if a, if a person is in a plane and that plane begins to nosedive, is anybody going to start listening to music when they're heading to death? No, you're going to repent. You're going to think about your sins. You're going to become afraid. So when the calamity befalls, the person with a normal heart is going to remember his sins and repent and return to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And also the hard heart will become soft. Naam, and the person will humble himself. And turn to their creator alone. So the person who is prevented from doing this at a time of a calamity, he is completely heedless. Right? If things get rough and we are still heedless, then this is complete heedlessness. As Allah Ta'ala said, Follow la if ja'ahum ba'suna to the ra'u walakin kosat kulubuhum was a jena lahum o shaytan ma kanu yamalun. And if only when our might, our power came to them and they humbled themselves, but their hearts became hard and shaitan beautified for them that which they used to do. Surah Al-An'am, verse number 43. And he said, And he said, And he said, and indeed, we sent to nations before you, and we seized them with our bats. We're going to explain what that means. This, this bats means, and it means 
poverty and sickness and illnesses and calamities. And we seize them with these things and with harm, perchance they may humble themselves. So in the big picture, trials are a mercy if the person returns to Allah Ta'ala. This coronavirus will be a mercy for the people if it makes people think, you know what? I'm not as strong and mighty as I thought I was. I need my Lord. Now I'm going to pray more. I'm going to try to rectify myself more. Then it's going to be a mercy. Now, lastly, we're going to end with some specific ways that people sin during a calamity. Of course, and we're going to mention six things and we're going to close out with this. Of course, by disobeying Allah Ta'ala and the Messenger, Alayhi Wasallam, in general. Just general sins. Also, number two, doing a calamity, something that's specific to the calamity is that some people, they disobey the ruler of their land. For example, when the COVID started, this COVID-19, many rulers told the people, pray in your homes. We're going to close the massage until we figure this thing out, know what we're dealing with. But some people disobey the rulers and they pray in the masjid anyway. These people are sinning by doing this. Number three, likewise, people that have a bad thought about Allah during the calamity. By believing that he will not remove this harm from the believers. You can never, we have to understand that Allah Ta'ala, he's going to bring us relief. That's what he does. Number four, which is very important, people endanger the safety of the people by spreading unfounded rumors. Whenever something like this happens, people get on the internet and they spread rumors saying this and that, things that have not even been verified. This is also something which is not permissible. Number five, some people, they begin to curse the time. They begin to curse the actual calamity. Some people, they curse the weather, etc. This is also not permissible. And the last one, which we found here in the United States of America that happened a lot, people begin to raise the price of merchandise during the calamity. And there comes a narration from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, whoever hoards is a sinner. Meaning, whoever holds on to merchandise during a calamity and then raises the price. Right? Some of the people when the COVID-19 hit here in America, they went out and they bought up all the hand sanitizer. And then they began to overprice the hand sanitizer. Something that would cost one dollar now costs ten or twenty dollars. Islam is so complete, it has a hadith about that fourteen hundred years ago. That it's not permissible to hoard to hold on to merchandise during a calamity and inflate the price. For the people. So this is what we wanted to present um, for our Muslim family in the Philippines at Wisdom Islamic School. May Allah Ta'ala bless you all in this life and the next. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salama ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Jazakumullah khairan. Just a quick question pertaining to sins done during the calamity. As you have mentioned that one of them, the second one, was uh, that they disobeyed the ruler of the land. So is this only in reference to the Muslim rulers or including the non-Muslim ru rulers? Barakallahu feekum. That's a good question. So when it comes to obeying the ruler, is it only in the Muslim country or the non-Muslim country? Also, it is also in the non-Muslim countries if that um, command is not against Islam. And in this case, when the, because for example, here in America, the president leaves it up to the governors of that particular state. And when the governor says, I want everyone to close down, this is not a command that goes against Islam. So we should obey that command. And this is the advice that we received from our ulama when we contacted them for this situation. Now. 
Jazakumullah khairan. So the second question is uh, pertaining to putting the people into danger by spreading rumors. So does this refer to those who initiate the rumors and spread it or that, does this include people who you know share these rumors? For example, in Twitter they retweet it, in Facebook they share it uh, and so on. Barakallahu feekum. This applies to everyone involved in it because it's not only the prohibition from initiating the rumor, but it's also not permissible to share that rumor. It's not also it's also not permissible to share that rumor. And I had experienced something like this not too long ago when someone, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy upon us and him, it was spreading around here in America a particular rumor about the a, for example, um, they said like some there, there was spies going around to the different masajid and seeing if they were praying apart and they found that they were not. So they closed down three different masajid. So this information had came to me. And so I went on the Internet and looked it up and it took about two minutes to find out that was just a rumor that someone had made up. So my point is, is that. A lot of these rumors, if you take two minutes out of your life to verify it, you find out that it's not true at all. So it's not permissible to initiate the rumor, nor to share the rumor. And Islam is based upon the Isnad, having a chain of narration that you can verify stuff. And this is the command of Surah Al-Hujurat. <clears throat> If there comes an evil person to you with, not, with information, then verify it. So it's obligatory to verify information before you pass that on. Now. Nah.